Hey, everybody. Welcome from the Sandler Submarine Headquarters. <laughs> we used Jim Dunn of Sandler, and so we had a meeting with him today. So we're using and camping out in his hood. And so uh, welcome. You guys know the drill. Q&A for all you newbies, <laughs> if there are any newbies. I don't think we do have any. That's, that's Q&A, not q and on. Yeah, not Q and on Q and A for the questions. <laughs> and chat, you can harass us. And man, Jack Santaniello, you have stepped up the game. I we've got the Sandler sub submarine, but you've got the graphic from this week. That's even better. It's subliminal. I call that subliminally overt. So I guess it's not subliminal anymore now that I revealed that that is burning in the back of everyone's head to get them kind of in the mood of thinking about what we're going to talk about. So yes. And I think you guys are tired of seeing kind of the same backgrounds. So, and that's why I'm wearing this jacket too, because I think I've, I've been in this shirt before, so I need something different. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so are you going to be talking about federal mandates or are you going to be talking about gobbledygook? That's, a, that's what I'm wondering about. I think that's synonymous at this point. Uh, so yes. <laughs> Well, rock and roll, and, and Mike Feldman, we will answer your question. Thank you for uh, sending that ahead of time. And if anybody didn't send something ahead of time, just have your questions ready. We are ready to answer and you know, do what we can to help you. All right. All right. Yeah, so first I wanna talk about kind of what happened uh, the past week with the vaccine mandate. And so, and, and this is kind of a little bit old news, but uh, as we uh, speculated, actually, last Thursday, that this it would turn out this way, which is the the big no to it being the, the mandate being applicable to businesses with 100 employees or more generally, that they did come back and they said that, well, uh, as, at least for facilities that receive Medicare or Medicaid um, money, that that can be uh, implemented. And it's interesting because uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, first of all, as you might expect, well, the, the ruling came down and I didn't realize the timing until I read more into this, that it was, there were, it was already three days into essentially when businesses were supposed to be implementing this stuff. So, you know, those businesses that are um, more conservative or cautious, I should use the word cautious in being in compliance following rules essentially, uh, may have already gone through the expense of, of starting to do that. Now there are private businesses and there's some big ones that are proceeding on their own to implement this type of mandate to a point where if you're not vaccinated, you get fired. Not if you're, if you are not vaccinated and you get tested, then you're okay. And so there's, there's some businesses that are going to that extreme. So it was, as you might recall, it was OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration that uh, the, the Supreme Court said that the president through OSHA does not have the broad reaching powers to implement this on private businesses, but then came back and said, well, with respect to uh, healthcare facilities, they do have the ability to do that um, within, is within their powers of, of regulation on the US citizens. And it was a, five to four majority that sided with the Biden administration. So, uh, you know, you talk about conservative and liberal judges and on the other side of things, it was uh, three liberal justices that were in the dissenting. It was Breyer, Sotomayor and Kagan that, that uh, said that the majority has usurped the power of Congress, the president and OSHA without legal basis. So, so the rule stands for right now that uh, hospitals and other facilities have to follow that, but private businesses, not so much. It's really up to owners how they want to implement this. And for all the reasons that we've been talking about for, for several weeks now, for months now, as to the what ifs, if I, as a business owner, implement this upon my employees and whatever variation, whether it is you're vaccinated or you're fired, you're vaccinated or you're tested, or uh, you know, if you're, um, it, or neither, it's like, okay, free roaming, 
you can tell us you're vaccinated and it's up to you if you want to, to be vaccinated or not, but we're not going to interfere in your private life. And then what is the impact on those decisions on you as an employer with respect to someone who gets COVID um, and transmits it uh, if you are on in any one of those columns? And so uh, it, and it's been interesting to see how this unfolds with vaccinated, boosted people getting Omicron. And, uh, but also, and I've actually had this in real life in our household, had one child that was a few days away from getting fully boosted, ended up with COVID thanks to one of his buddies on a school trip uh, and brought it home. And, you know, we, the three of us, my daughter and, and the two parents, maybe had mild symptoms, but it wasn't anything. And, and I attribute that to the booster, but that, again, that's my own personal experience that, that we went through, but I've heard similar stories and I've heard also people that are boosted that are getting Omicron, but it's, um, uh, it's not as bad. Our, one of our IT people showed up and I'm actually in my office today, uh, showed up in our office after a long bout with uh, COVID pneumonia, double pneumonia, and he had a, a really good pulmonolo pulmonologist that uh, explained that the original, the original COVID sits at the bottom of your lungs, and that's why you end up with uh, pneumonia. And Omicron and Delta end up towards the top of your lungs, and that's why you feel like the ickiness and the, the sore throats and things like that. And so I'm not a doctor. I assume that that's true. And since he lived it, uh, that that's probably accurate. So. Um, Anyway, went off on a tangent on medical stuff. But anyway, so there's that. Um, and then there is uh, just a, a, a little bit on the potential COVID, uh, additional COVID relief in the form of money. Now, what is uncertain is what is the purpose of that money? Is it the purpose to send money to businesses so that they can implement things, voluntarily implement protocols and programs to prevent the sp spread or reduce the spread of COVID in the work environments? Or is this going to be direct dollars into uh, owners and employers' pockets? And as Adam and I speculated, I think last week or the week before, that it's probably unlikely that those dollars are going to go directly to employers to subsidize things like payroll and other business expenses. Uh, it is probably more likely, and again, this is a jack theory, uh, and, and potentially an atom theory that uh, that money would go towards prevention and slowing down COVID and, and creating a, a, a more hospitable work environment um, for employees to come back to work. And then on the flip side of that, you have the, well, they don't want to, a lot of people don't want to come back to work and they've gotten used to this hybrid situation where, uh, hey, I can work from home. And employers are saying, hey, maybe it's more efficient for our workers to work at home, presuming that they're actually working, but saving the, the drive time in and out of the office. And uh, what's also interesting is uh, someone said to me, a client said to me, yeah, this, this working from home is a mixed blessing because you know, when, they're, when, when people are in the office, they tend to talk a lot amongst themselves and have chats, you know, water cooler kind of chats. And now they're at home and they're you know, doing home stuff and changing light bulbs, hanging out with the kids and dogs. So it's kind of like trading one for the other. And I said, well, okay, but maybe that is in both cases better for uh, our psychology of being in this environment that you know, we have a mental break to, to get to and either have it the waterside cooler chats or play with the dog for a few minutes, whatever it may be. So again, I don't know if on another tangent, but those are kind of the two big things, which is potential money coming in bound to businesses for COVID related stuff. And then what happened over the past week or so with respect to man vaccine mandates on private companies in comparison to Medicare, Medicaid funded uh, businesses or, or facilities. Yeah. Um, so the, you know, to, to, put a bullet in this one, Jack. I mean, I guess the way that I think about this is that if I take government money or I work for the government, you know, now it sounds like in any form, 
you know, pretty much vaccine mandate because the original mandate was that all government employees or independent contractors, if you're in a government facility, had to be vaccinated. Um, that, that got upheld and has not changed to my knowledge. Um, then the second piece was even if you're not that, but if you take Medicare, Medicaid money, which is pretty much going to cover a lot of healthcare, then you have to have, then you have to have, um, be vaccinated or this testing regime. But outside of that, the, the, the broader mandate that was meant to cover everybody else, that's, you know, that's off the table and, you know, going to be, you know, maybe, maybe another government jurisdiction tries to pass something. Maybe they try to do something where, if you want to ride on a plane, you got to have something. I mean, it, you know, there, there's other things it could do, but for now, you know, having it be a uh, ticket to work is off the table. Um, yeah. And, and having said that too, there is uh, in, in president Biden, his kind of put back was, but you know, you understand as private businesses, you can do certain things. I mean, he didn't basically say go and do it. Well, I guess he kind of did, but it's uh, you know, so he reminded people. And then he also said, you know, okay. Yeah. It, well, I don't know if he said it, but maybe by not saying it, that what about state governments? What about local governments? What is the their their ability to set rules locally for those things? I think that um, you know it, they would follow the Supreme Court's kind of filtering down of perspective, which is uh, that governments on the local and state level can't do it because the feds can't do it either. So, but, you know, there's that separation of fed and state. And a lot of times, you know, state rights and the ability of a state legislature to do things that are considered overreaching by the federal government that sometimes do work in the state regime. I'm not yeah. saying that it would, I'm just saying that there's, you know, thought process that that might be a possibility yeah. and being encouraged by the feds because of their loss on at the Supreme Court. Yeah, and I think what I find so to, to again just to 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 recap it for the listeners and the people that watch this after the fact, you know, if if so basically what it sounds like it's coming down to is, you know, I work for the government or I take government money, you know, as an independent contractor, I take government money through health care. Um, that's that's mandated by the federal government. If as an employer, I say, look, vaccinated or you're out, that's standing up in court. You know, if I as the employer make that choice, that's holding up in court too. And that seems like it's going to stand. And then the last one that I think seems to be standing as well is um, stuff like you can't come in a restaurant <laughs> or you can't come back to school, like those types of mandates at a localized level seem to also be holding up um, as well. Is that a pretty good, is that a pretty good take on it? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think that business owners are, are, they need to assess their local constituency. So if, you know, people are, are coming in, I mean, and I, I've said this before on this program that uh, there are times where I've walked in, sometimes walked in with my family, looked around and I'm like, okay, it's the wild, wild west. I mean, not the servers are not even wearing masks. And so, um, I'm out and we're out. Uh, and so it, it's, and there are places I know that some of my friends will only go to places where they feel safe and comfortable and that uh, a mandate or rules are being set up that you don't want, you, if you're not vaccinated, you're not welcome is the message. And so you have to make a business decision because you're going to alienate people either way you choose. So, uh, but yes, I would say that in, in food service industries, like, um, you know, whether it's sit down or, you know, even quick serve restaurants uh, or places like Starbucks. Although I think I heard that Starbucks maybe is reducing their requirement on employees to wear uh, or to be vaccinated or maybe even to wear masks. Yeah. I don't know if that's true they or not, but it. okay, they did. Okay. Yeah, I just saw that this week. Yeah. Um, Carhartt on the other side said, you get vaxxed or you're out, which is interesting considering their constituents. <laughs> so it'll, we'll see what happens, right? I mean, but you're right. There's a there's polarization. No, there's, no, there's no better outdoor jacket though. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm mad as heck that they did that, but I'm still going to buy the jacket. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, usually what happens. 
Well, that's what the ski slopes of West Virginia are filled with, Carhartt. So yeah. Anyway, um, here's a good question. Uh, thanks, Bruce, for sending this. But here's the what's the best? So this is still on the COVID thing, but it's dealing with funds. What's the best source of information for unspent COVID relief funds? Uh, a summary of the federal government's funding program uh, provided uh, is only part of the story in their financial reporting. How is it to identify unspent funds in state and local government budgets? It doesn't seem like, hold on. This is interesting research and uh, reporting in the national and local media. I don't have a bias, I just struggled to level set expectations on what is possible to achieve from government and initiatives like rental assistance, ventilation improvements in schools, et cetera. Uh, thoughts? That's a really good question that we don't have an answer to now, or at least I don't have an answer to now in terms of like a one-stop shop because you basically, you know, you're starting at the you're starting at the federal level, and then the federal money got distributed to state and local governments, <laughs> you know, and then state and local governments also did some of their own things, and then there's some some industry specific initiatives um, that happen. So that there isn't there isn't a one stop shop. I think broadly speaking, though, what I would say is still left and available is gonna be more local grant oriented. So at the county level um, and the municipality level and even at the state level to some extent, that, that's the kind of stuff that's left um, and available to apply for, which, which generally speaking, it, you know, it's not nothing, but you know, for the most part, you know, might be capped at, you know, $25,000, $50,000, you know, kind of on the high side, but that, that's, that's the stuff that's still left. Um, so it's a good question that, that we'll, we'll do some digging to try to have some answers to by the next webinar. Yeah. And I think that, um, and, and I'm not aware of kind of anything that aggregates all this information, but, you know, Adam, you had mentioned uh, the uh, industries. So for example, the, the IFA, National Franchise, uh, International Franchise Association, the ABA Franchise Forum in uh, their constituency are franchise lawyers. And so, uh, you know, they publish things that, hey, there's little pockets of money. But also I would check with on um, uh, local trade groups uh, or chambers of commerce and see if things are being published because things, you know, there's, there's money going in and out all the time. So for example, uh, it may be that the foundation for the Carolinas puts some you know, receives some money and then puts it out there. And so that's something that would happen here in Charlotte that would be put out there that that is is new to new money into the, the game of things. So I would check on the state and local levels. Um, I'm not aware of like the NCDOR publishing anything like that, but uh, I, I would start with maybe some trade groups and chambers of commerce to see what they're publishing and putting out there, which again, does change. So, you know, check in once a week or so if you're looking for that kind of information uh, as far as opportunities to get more money, but as far as what is being, if, with this excess money, what they might be doing with it, uh, alternatively on an alternative allocation of resources, uh, unknown at this point. Uh, there are some buckets of money that have not been fully spent, and I'm not aware of uh, where those have been reallocated, but they'll be spent somewhere. It just may not be where we want it to be spent. Lots of pork projects that need money, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think to Jack's point, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, well, how would I go find that out? I think, I think he's kind of spot on in terms of you know, I probably I probably would look to the NC Chamber of Commerce to see what they've got. And then I would look at the Charlotte Business Alliance, you know, it's kind of my first two destination spots to say, all right, well, what do you have? And if they don't have anything, it's like, wow, but if they don't have anything, probably nobody has anything. You know, and it, and it comes down to like independent, independent specific asks, but we'll do some digging. So and I would say also one more resource now that I think about it, because there's a meeting this afternoon 
the uh, the Hospitality and Tourism Alliance, uh, I think, maintains information. And if you get on their um, on Muhammad uh, Janishan's email list, they will send out stuff. Uh, you have to kind of also, uh, uh, Muhammad has no issue with sharing how he feels about things. Um, he's very much a cheerleader of Charlotte and has been for many decades, but he uh, does not mince words about how um, when he believes something has happened or a decision that has been made that, uh, and I use this legal term every once in a while, the bonehead things, he will let you know. So uh, be aware that that's part of the package if you go start getting those emails. But if you're in hospitality, tourism, so food and beverage, that kind of thing, then that's that may also be a good resource for you. Is, is Bonehead part of the bar exam? I'm just curious if it's one of the answers. You know, I may have used that in in exam answer as to you know give a point, but I've I've used that in conversations and said, okay, you know, let's just get down to it and so yes i have used that in uh in negotiations it's intimidating for people like us from kansas to hear highfalutin terms like bonehead you know <laughs> so here's a question from mike feldman thank you for sending this now jack if you still have your email from <laughs> where he had that he has a, a couple links in there but i'll read it, it says i have not heard anything in the news about erc getting reinstated for Q4, but I did notice that a bill, HR 6161, was introduced in the House in December. Then I saw uh, just in the last few weeks, more co-sponsors were added, now has 42 co-sponsors in the House. And he sent links to uh, the, test the bill uh, as well as uh, co-sponsors, wondering if Adam or Jack has any news insights as to what's happening on that bill. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for time for you, Jack. It, I think, to me, this is one of those areas of technical correction. Wow, we didn't really mean to do that. <laughs> um, mistakes which is, you know, part of the negotiation of the infrastructure bill was, you know, a one or a one quarter um, acceleration of eliminating the employee retention tax credit, but then the house didn't pass the infrastructure bill until after the quarter expired. So what did we do? Well, we didn't change that. It seemed like an oversight. Um, this feels a lot like the can I deduct PPP expenses or not <laughs> um, problem that, you know, some people are hoping and praying for some guidance from the IRS. Some the IRS's position is no, you know, the law was pretty clear, cut off third quarter. Sorry about that, guys. You know, let's stick with the law. So then it comes down to we have to fix this through legislation, which is what this um, House bill is meant to do. I think the challenge is that. Uh, I, I think the, I think the challenge is just the focus, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not giving, you know, if I'm, if I'm betting on this one, you know, if I, when I was betting on the tax position, there was a lot of noise around the tax position. We clearly got it wrong. We're going to get to it. We know we're going to do another stimulus package and bipartisan support for another stimulus package. We'll fix it there. In this case, I feel like it's just getting lost in the system. So I'm not, I'm not feeling better than 25% on this one, you know, frankly, just from it getting lost, you know, lost in the system, because, you know, because I think the, the Senate was clear on when they wanted it to stop. That's why they passed with bipartisan support what they passed. So, I mean, you'd have to have them say, you know, hey, your intent was cut it off a quarter early but because we stalled over here, can you give them an extra quarter? I don't know, man. That's a tough. That, I see that. I see that. Even if it passed the House, I'm wondering how it's going to make it to this, make it to the Senate. You know, frankly. Yeah, and I'm not given, seeing a whole, given that the Senate ahead. was the one that changed it in the first place. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I think that you know, keep in mind that for things to happen there has to be consensus and consensus, consensus building to get to a consensus. 
and each individual and each pocket of individuals in Congress have their own, and I don't wanna say agenda, I own priorities and that, you know, what they feel strongly about and they feel in, in, in wrapped in all of that is how they feel that the American public has been cheated and how to fix. And then once you identify the, the, the issue, how you're gonna fix it. And then what are the effects of the decision? I mean, I, I you know, someone analogized a, a decision, and every, actually every decision that any of us ever make, but it was in the context of a, uh, someone in Congress making a decision or in, in evaluating where to go. It's like, okay, you're on the shore and you throw a rock into uh, the water and then you have the ripple that goes out from there and each each direction, I guess it's a vector, um, you know, is has different consequences, it's going different places. So which vector do you go on uh, and, and to get to the end result? So the desired end result of the consensus. So that is the challenge in, in trying to course correct and deal with any of these issues. And, and I think that you know, people have moved on, meaning, Congress and state legislatures have moved on to, you know, these other issues that are more um, uh, burning hotter and faster in front of in front of them, um, and taking little detours like voter reform and that kind of thing. But yeah. um, I I dare not say that because now I don't know if that how you know having said that how Adam. You know, okay, I can see, is the temperature rising? Is he getting redder when I said <laughs> voter reform? <laughs> Looking for a solution to a problem that didn't exist. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah. the, uh, yeah, so if I go back to this one, you know, to it, earlier in our <laughs> webinars, you know, we were kind of bullish on, hey, there'll be, there'll, you know, th there'll be a fix for the fourth quarter. Um, but But my thought on that in the details would have been, that the house would have passed a version that included the fourth quarter and they would have fixed it. Oh yeah. We screwed that up in the Senate. Let's go with it. They didn't do that. So now you're stuck with having to do a separate piece of legislation. I just don't see, unless there's some broader um, stimulus package that gets passed. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't see it. I'm not feeling good about it as a standalone piece of legislation. And so it'd be baked back into would it be part of broader stimulus maybe but that's probably not going to happen for another quarter you know if, if that happens that, that would be related to what jack started with which is going to be more you know ppe specific oriented type stuff not you know gary here's a check to go subsidize your payroll type stuff yeah well hopefully um Congress will actually work on getting the budget. <laughs> yeah. Dealing with that. Be something. <laughs> something productive that we actually need. All right. So I knew I could count on you. Robert, good to see you here. Here's the question. Will the SBA be sending out reminder notices informing the recipients of EIDL when the first payment's due and how to use pay.gov? Um. I, I don't, maybe I don't view that as likely. I think the more likely scenarios are gonna publish something on the SBA website is my own, my own opinion on that. I think what will end up happening is maybe you'll get a letter in the email, you know, or a letter that says, by the way, your first payment was due and you didn't make it. Um, but, you know, we may be surprised. <laughs> I was trying to find the answer quickly while you were stalling, but um, I don't, I, I have not, I am not aware of it. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, it's kind of like, okay, they're a lender. So you would think that they would do what normal lenders would do with respect to managing their loan portfolio. But I think that in this instance, because they have so much other stuff going on, unless they can really very easily automate it and push a button and say, all right, here you go, computer, send them out. Well, that, um, and that's where I feel that's where I feel like there's a low degree of likelihood that this program will be implemented successfully on a reminder standpoint and stuff like that. It's because if you look at if you look at the SBA 
loan programs in general, the SBA is not the servicing organization. It's a local bank that's a servicing organization. Whereas in this scenario, the SBA is the servicer and that's not their core competency, which is why I think that you see so many problems with the EDL program, you know, in terms of like getting responses back, how do I pay it, all that kind of stuff. That's just not, they're not a servicer. I mean, they don't, they don't, the government generally does not service loans because you're, you know, er, with, with limited exceptions, most everything is, is serviced by a third party that's experienced at servicing a loan. And that's just not that. So to stall Jack for time to, to segue into voter reform, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I'm going to share my opinion since you brought it up. Um, if you go back to the root cause issue, I think that all of this would go away, you know, because I think that with all the voter reform, I mean, you know, in a specific state, you're like, oh my God, we're going backwards. But then you can find, you know, another state that has, you know, an opposing party that actually has the same rule that the, these. So in other words, I think all that's nonsense and all of it would be potentially fixed if we had um, nonpartisan districts. So box over. Mm, that makes sense. Well, I mean, I'm like North Carolina is, is an example, like at the end of the day, we're pretty close to 50, 50 state yet. Our representatives are in our state in our local general assembly is like 80, 20. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't, that, it, yeah. it, it, that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, unless you pass the ballot initiative, which I don't even know if you can do in North Carolina, you can't fix it unless you win, but then it's rigged to where you can't win. So it's like, any, any, anywho, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> so one public service announcement kind of along that line with North Carolina. If you're a BGW client, a week ago, you got a notice. We went through our database of business uh, returns and businesses that are due for a refund because North Carolina took for freaking ever to get in compliance with the federal mandate. PPP funds um, were not tax deductible or the expenses towards PPP were not tax deductible until after the extensions hit, taxes were filed and then, oh yeah, okay, we'll be in conformity, which means that you need to amend the return if you've got money coming back. So we sent a note and said, hey, by the way, and we cut our um, amended fee returns dramatically. And then we still had people like, well, gosh, all you do is press a button. We wish we had that button. <laughs> you know, could we get somebody to develop that? But that's not the case. There's still uh, time and effort that has to go in. And by the way, whoever signs on that has, has some liability too to make sure it's accurate. So the point is, and then Jack sent and Yellow sent this to us. So there is a client alert. And uh, Jack, I don't know if you could put a link in the chat at some point, but the client alert that does specifically talk about North Carolina businesses likely need to file uh, an amended tax return. That would be cool. Uh, so we're all on the same page on that. But just so you know, there's not an easy button that we just press and then boom, it's done. No, it's not that way. We wish it was. Yeah, and to be, to be super specific, if you're a C corporation, you absolutely need to file an amended business return. If you're a flow through entity, you need to file an amended individual return. And then the Department of Revenue was KG on, you know, well, you don't need to, but we're not going to issue any guidance on that. <laughs> you know, like, in other words, like they just, they didn't, they didn't force you to, but they didn't say you didn't have to in the North, in the, um, in the North Carolina Department of Revenue guidance for flow through entities, but you absolutely have to amend your individual return if you were an S corporation or a partnership or a sole proprietorship. So, so there you go. And the chat, check it out. The uh, link is there. So thanks for being Johnny on the spot, Jack. Appreciate that. Um, but do, get it and swipe it and copy it and paste it somewhere before this broadcast ends. Because as Jack has found out, <laughs> it, 
if you shut down your computer, or this is over and you didn't do it, it's gone. <laughs> so, yeah. And, <laughs> and for the people that are wanting some ghetto math on what's that rebate going to equate to, if you're a flow through entity, it's basically take your PPP funds times 5%. That's what you're going to be due back from North Carolina. Um, if you're a C corporation, it's going to be less than that. But if you're a, um, if you're if you're an individual flow through entity, you know generically PPP that you receive times five percent times your percentage ownership of the company is going to be the number that you're due back from North Carolina. It separates that from any other part of the North Carolina tax you had to pay. That's a good rule of thumb. Even guys like me from Kansas, we can figure that out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and a lot of people, I mean. To that point, Gary, I mean, when we sent out the broad email notice, a lot of our clients didn't even know that that was a component of the North Carolina income tax because they were minority owners in businesses. So there are passive investors in businesses that receive PPP funds. So they were part of the North Carolina tax. They didn't even know it. Like, I didn't receive PPP funds. No, but the business that you invested in did. Therefore, you're due a refund. So it's not just like I got the money directly in my business. I mean, it also applies to passive investments. If your passive investment received PPP funds. Where else are you going to hear that? Tell me. <laughs> so I have something to share to make sure everybody gets their money's worth today that I, would, I, I thought about with, with Robert's question as far as whether you, you know, re, uh, loan recipients are going to get any type of notice. But this is kind of a, a general observation that maybe informs the answer to that question as to maybe why the SBA might not do it. But generally speaking, there seems to be a trend by lenders and landlords, for example, that you know you consider essentially kind of landlord as a lender essentially that's lending property and you're, and you're paying your rent which is kind of your loan um, amount but um, as far as payments go on rent so uh, if if you look carefully at your leases you will probably find a bifurcation of the requirements for payments of your rent and then payments of other stuff and other breaches so basically in the breach section, it will say something along the lines of, uh, you have a five day cure period from the due date of your rent payment to, so it basically gives you a work week in case there's a holiday or something like that, that they didn't receive it. In many other cases, you end up with a 30 day or 15 day cure period that they say, hey, look, you were supposed to be open until nine o'clock every day on a weekday. And we received word that you shut down at eight o'clock. Now, in COVID times, there's a little more leniency, but I'm just by way of example. So essentially, the lease says one thing and you didn't do what you were supposed to. So they give you notice and say, don't do it again. Um, the reason why I bring this up is, is that uh, even though you have five days, no, uh, you know, keep in mind that it is five days from the due date. So if it is the first of the month, then you have five days. It's not five days from the date they tell you, hey, you missed your payment. Whereas in other cases, it may be 30 days from the date of notice that they told you you had terminated or that you had breached the, the lease agreement. The reason why that's important is that there's, it seems to be less leniency or understanding of missing, even in COVID times, missing that payment. So if you have a landlord that's been, okay, you know, find, trying to find a way to kick you out or, uh, you know, basically wants to charge you on that sixth day and you're like, no, wait, uh, the, the, the attitude, I think, of kind of the judiciary has been um, in this day and age, you can imagine what that examination would look like. Well, sir or ma'am, Mr. or Miss business owner, um, do you not use some sort of calendaring program? Yes. Does that calendar programming not have a uh, ability to remind you of things? Yes. Okay. So there's problem number one. Problem number two is, um, do you bank with a major bank or any type of bank that uses electronic commerce? Yes. Um, is there not a way to set things for automatic payment? You know the amount and you know the date. So why don't you just set it up? 
And the excuse mostly is, well, I want to make sure I have the cash to pay it, which is a horrible excuse because, I mean, you have the obligation regardless. So basically what you're saying is, is that I know I'm supposed to pay on the first. I know I get five extra days, but just in case I can't make the payment, I'm not going to set it up for auto pay. So just be aware of that, that if, you know, that those are two things that you should be doing with respect to uh, anything that is fixed, that has a significant penalty uh, in particular, not a upon notice that the cure period starts the cure period the, those things that the cure period just starts at least by the passage of time you need to be a little more careful about in your business yeah the last time i checked when i was uh registered as a securities guy not security but securities <laughs> the sin of omission was just as deadly as the sin of commission well, I didn't know. There's no excuse under the law. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think your your advice is wise. You know, don't. Well, the teacher didn't tell me I had to do that. Uh, well, actually, they did. You knew what the terms were if you read it, and uh, so I think that's really prudent advice. Any questions out there? We will be happy to answer those. Uh, nice little crew on today. Uh, next week, just so you know, while you're thinking about those questions, we've got a treat for you. We are going to have mergers and acquisitions war stories. Stuff that um, all of us have been through. Everyone, all three of us. Um, and it's not just for telling stories. Uh, we like doing that, but they have a point on things, especially, and the reason we're going down this path next week is there's still a ton of money out there that, and there's a lot of deals that are happening. All the mergers and acquisitions folks like Jack are really busy. Um, but most people, this is the first time or the one or, time in their life if they're contemplating buying or selling that they go through that and there are lots of pitfalls there are lots of um things to to be wary of and so um that's what we want to do next week if you guys have additional thoughts but that was a you know timely thing that we just keep seeing a lot of deals a lot of people are contemplating deals and we want to provide you some wisdom on don't step in that pile of smoldering whatever it is. <laughs> so. And I would also say, Gary, that it's not just in the moment, meaning going through the M&A transaction. It's the what you should be doing one year, two years, three years, five years prior to that in order to, you know, and I tell clients, okay, you got to make your business sexy or no one's going to, you know, come looking for you kind of thing. And so how do you do those things? And what are some things that a potential buyer may look at and say, yeah, don't like about, you know, whether it's, you know, networking capital, whether it's, you have too many people working, you have too many people working in the wrong areas, you know, you, you, why haven't you implement, why are you still using green bar paper on your printer to do things, you know, the pencils, whatever it may be. So, uh, those kind of things. I mean, we're not going to get down to dealing whether you use a pencil or a pen or a highlighter or what color, but uh, you know, those kind of things that we see as a recurring um, and, and actually that I, on, when I'm on buyer side that I use as ammunition to basically say, you know, deduct a purchase price. That's a deduct a purchase price. That's a deduct a purchase price or fix it before closing. And then sometimes they just say, okay. And, and we may be as buyers, in a better position to fix the issue. And you see that a lot of times with older businesses, and I should say businesses that are owned by older individuals that have not embraced the full range of technology to make things more efficient. So that's, the, and that's when a lot of times these transactions occur that you have either if, if it's a, you know, an investment buyer or an equity buyer or a strategic buyer, if it's a strategic buyer, it may be that integrating uh, assets and processes into their own because they can do it at a lower cost uh, versus what was being done by the prior owner using essentially kind of old school processes. And we see that happening over and over again. So again, just 
sharing some more stories, but with a purpose of sharing some things. So that way you're thinking about it in your own business. Uh, and, and a lot of it, it's not necessarily only for the purposes of an M&A transaction. It's things like, okay, I may not be ready for an M&A transaction, but that's something that I should be doing in my business now anyway, as a good practice moving forward, uh, just because it's, it's good practice. So there's, all of those things kind of combined. Um, obviously, we could spend days talking about it, so we'll try to, to you know, be focused on what we say. And it may be a, a you may have to rewind the tape to kind of get the full, um, the full breadth of of what is being said. But because we're going to try to get through a lot, um, not melt your brain, but get through a, enough that you know to hopefully hit something that's going on in your business. I could see doing that as a regular kind of series quite frankly because there's a lot i just found out like a week ago um and i won't use any names obviously but there's a, a firm that sold to uh, a uk firm it's a local firm sold to a uk firm they had concentration risk with 70 percent of the revenue on one ginormous client well the the UK firm wanted a foothold here for a number of reasons. They bought it. Uh, that 70% client left this month. It's kind of like buying a car and you the transmission fell out before you even turned on to the main road. You bought it. <laughs> you know, like what are the things that you can do to prevent that? You know, I we have friends that have sold that had huge concentration risk and it ended up working out really great because it was still a strategic buy and the transmission didn't fall out. But um, there are a lot of those kind of things. So I, you know, and again, whether you're wanting to sell or not, making your business more profitable and more enjoyable <laughs> for you and your, your employees, what's not to like about that? You don't even have to want to sell, you know? So those are some things that I think that'll be worth talking about so and any other questions to, out there to continue your analogy while other people are thinking about questions is that you know, as far as the transmission falling out knowing what the service records of that automobile are so for example that contract with that seven or the the, the arrangement with that 70 percent concentration what was the contractual arrangement so you know it, it must have been maybe it could be terminated upon certain days notice without without um uh uh, without cause, you know, and so that's something that the buyer needs to analyze. And so, and, and what we do also, when we're looking through material contracts is to say, okay, what is the longevity of this revenue stream? Um, and, and understand, so that way they can, they can not easily jettison us as a service provider or a goods provider. And so that becomes part of the analysis. And so in that transaction, it's likely that the UK firm did, hopefully did an analysis and, and said, okay, it's worth the longevity and hopefully we can win them over for a renewal on that contract. So it's those kind of things too, that you know we'll talk about that uh, in the due diligence phase from a buyer's perspective and what can the seller do. And a lot of times we'll make the seller uh, have a reaffirmation or renewal or exercise renewal rights within the contract before we become the owners. Uh, and then we can talk about things like, okay, um, uh, lack of assignability or change in control provisions, which are always important in M&A type transactions. But those kind of things are important when you're negotiating those contracts to be able, if, if you think there's going to be a, a, you as a sale transaction, as, as a selling entity, are there things you can do on, on the earlier aspect of things when you're negotiating contracts to be able to basically flip it and the other contracting party is obligated to honor that contract. So um, again, just throwing out some teasers on, on, some of the things that we can talk about and, and Gary, you're right. Maybe what we do is we uh, implement a kind of after we go through next week is maybe every once in a while throw in, you know, M and a 101 or, or 201 kind of thing into sprinkling things as things come up for us uh, as, you know, kind of like a mini war story segment of this program. Yeah. 
learn from other uh, people's experiences is a far cheaper way to go. <laughs> so anyway, well, everybody, thank you for joining us in, uh, in the submarine of Sandler. <laughs> and if you don't know what that's about, you ought to go check it out. There are a number of good Sandler coaches in town. We use Jim Dunn, but there are other good, good ones in town too. So, uh, but the framework's really good. So uh, we will put this up on the BGW YouTube channel this afternoon so that anybody that came in late, hopefully we've addressed your thoughts and questions. And if not, you can hit us up and we'll be back here on the same bat channel, probably different location, but we'll be back next week with M&A award stories. So anything else, Jack, Adam? I'm good. Do we want to tease anybody with our intentions on our hundredth or our 10th oh. you know, show or, or not yet? Is it too early? Too early. It, yeah, so just know this was week 95. Our 100th week, week anniversary is coming up and we're probably going to do something special. <laughs> A live studio audience could be. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and it, it won't be quite as, you know, interesting as the Jimmy Fallon show. I'm just sorry. <laughs> but... <laughs> Nonetheless, that's what we're thinking of doing. So you guys have a great rest of the week. Uh, buy plenty of uh, milk, bread, and toilet paper because Snowmageddon's coming tomorrow. <laughs> See ya. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>